Hi, we continue today in Revelation 18 with the center section, the lament of the kings in the C section of the chiasm and the D and the D prime sections at the center, the merchant's lament. As we got that chiasm from De Villers that we've been following since the beginning of the chapter. And I note on the left side, there's another model of how to structure, see the structure of Revelation 18 from Catherine Maloney, where she sees the shape model on Amos 5. And we've been looking at a couple of sections, the warning lament and the admonition, and now we're on the judgment section. As we saw last time, it also can be seen as parallel, um, structured on Isaiah 47 and Jeremiah 50, highlighting how John is showing that what his audience in the, in the Roman province of Asia in the late first century is experiencing is similar or very similar, same as what the ancestors experienced in the time of exile or under their own oppressive leaders in Jerusalem. And we, from our perspective, can see continues throughout history from uh, after Rome into our time now. And we'll see that in detail as this section really highlights the link that I've been trying to highlight throughout this whole section, that this is not about violence against women or about women at all, but about exploitive imperial cities uh, that gain wealth wealth through commerce for the, at the benefit of the few at the expense of the many. So as we begin to look at it, let's also consider possible um, other elements of the overall view. So uh, this chiasm has a D and a D prime part. We've seen chiasms that often have just one central part like A, B, C, B, A, but some have a double section in the middle. We've seen A, B, B, A ones and little units. And so de Villers shows this. Let's look at that in detail so we can see how those parallels work there. And I color coded them so you can see them more clearly. The merchant of the earth weep and mourn for her and hear the merchants weeping and mourning aloud. No one buys their cargo anymore as paralleled by who gained wealth, which is to say no one will, they won't be gaining wealth from her anymore. Um, the elements of the cargo here that are similar, or identical actually, to what she's dressed in, the great city dressed in, and then the description here that it's all lost to you and the wealth has been laid waste or has been abandoned. So we see the, the tight parallel between those two pieces. We've also been looking at the key words throughout, and in this section we're looking at the morning section, so we're focusing on the kings and the merchants, but when we look wider, we see these refrains, alas, alas, the great city, uh, all three times in this section. Um, so all about fear of her torment and, um, and mourning and weeping over her. We've also been looking at the detailed Hebrew scripture connections in addition to those overall passages that form a larger shape, the specific echoes we see here, and especially the, the cargo list in Ezekiel um, that will be parallel in many ways, and I've highlighted the elements that are the same. But the Ezekiel list is even longer than the list we see in Revelation. Uh, so with that in mind, let's begin to take a look here. And as we start, we see, um, And the kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. The kings of the earth is certainly a theme in Revelation, and I shape the eight references to kings of the earth in what I at least see as a chiastic shape. I've not found any scholars who have seen it that way, but you can decide for yourselves. And it produces an interesting uh, dynamic here. At the beginning is the lamb as the ruler of the kings of the earth, and at the end the kings will walk by New Jerusalem's light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. So the text is framed by the recognition that God is above the rulers of the kings of the earth. But within that frame, we see the kings of the earth in, in uh, engagement with the Lamb, here afraid of the wrath of the Lamb, which is a satirical image we saw then. The idea of the kings and everybody else hiding from that angry Lamb is obviously meant to be funny. And here we see in chapter 19, even after they've experienced the burning of Babylon, they're making war against the rider on the horse who's plainly the Lamb and against his army. And so in the center sections, we see the commitment between the kings and the whore Babylon, the great city. And so we see that the issue of committed fornication with her and lived in luxury with her in both these sections. And this middle section here, although it's 1718 and 183 b really forms one consistent sentence at the middle with the repetition of kings of the earth this way. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth who have committed fornication with her. So that's the key here is to get them along with uh, God's people that we saw last time to stop committing fornication with her. And unlike Babylon itself or the dragon or the beast, which are all destroyed, the kings of the earth are called to be redeemed. Uh, echoing Isaiah 60 here. So they're not called to be destroyed. They're, they're regathered into uh, the right place to be subject to God. So that's the hopeful framework for these kings, even though they will, we will see them making war on the lamb and against his army there. 
And they're described as weeping and wailing. Um, the idea of kings weeping, of course, that would be uh, feminizing for them and the gender stereotypes at the time. It would be a real insult, a real weakness for them to be uh, weeping. When King David weeps over his lost son, uh, Absalom, his uh, chief of staff, Joab, tells him to shape up so he doesn't lose the, the allegiance of the people in the face of that. Uh, they will weep and wail. Unlike the others who will weep and mourn down here, they will weep and wail. The word for wail, copto here, literally means to cut off or to strike, but metaphorically is to wail only one other time. So the idea of these kings weeping and wailing is to see them as if something has died. And of course, something has died, not someone has died, and that's the great city Babylon. When they see the smoke of her burning here, which again in our uh, Hebrew scripture echoes, plainly echoes uh, uh, Abraham seeing the smoke of the burning of Babel, of uh, Sorry, of Sodom here in Genesis 19. And that parallel is made already by Isaiah in Isaiah 13 that Babylon will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. So it's not just me making that connection. That connection was already made with Isaiah and John brings it forward here so that we can hear that, that whether it's Rome, you know, in the metaphorical use of Babylon here or of Babylon or Sodom, whatever it is, this burning city um, is an expression of God's judgment on their injustice. And they will not participate here. They're not going to support Babylon. They're not defending Babylon. They, like the merchants and the ship owners and the seafarers, will stand far off in fear of their torment. So again, characterized as not kingly at all. They're feminized and they're weeping and wailing and they're afraid. Um, hardly um, the model of kings that anybody would like. And they say an interesting thing here that's translated alas, but it's really woe, ooey, that we saw earlier. And that's the refrain that we just saw all three groups say, alas, alas, the great city. Woe, woe. And that's echoing what, what I was arguing back here in chapter 8 was the three woes translated as woes there represent the fall of the great city three times. Twice as Jerusalem, the historical fall of Jerusalem to Babylon in the 6th century BCE and to Rome in the first century CE and the metaphorical fall of Babylon or Rome here in the story. And that's what they're paralleling here. The fall of Babylon gets the woe. So uh, contrary to what scholars otherwise saw as, as different meanings of the woes back there, this reinforces it here. Notice that Babylon is framed here by great city and mighty city or strong city. We've seen Iskara a couple times here. We saw it in verse three for um, for the strong or verse one. I'm sorry for the strong angel at the beginning of the chapter. So these images of great city, strong city, but in one hour it's all coming down. And the one hour uh, we recall here from 1712, we saw authority. Uh, kings received authority for one hour, but now we see this trinity of one hours in our section here. In one hour, your judgment has come. In one hour, all this wealth has been laid waste or has been abandoned or made a desert. And in one hour, she, the city itself, has been laid waste. So um, all of this happening suddenly, despite all the buildup, um, that it all comes crashing down. And then we focus on the merchants. So let me scroll down here a little bit so we can see more of the merchants and the cargo here. So to focus on the merchants, we have to understand something of the cultural context of how Romans saw merchants. And we can start no better here than this quote from Cicero's On Duties, where he says this. Another disreputable class includes those who buy lots from wholesalers to retail immediately. They would not make a profit unless they indulge in misrepresentation, and nothing is more criminal than fraud. Commerce should be considered vulgar if it is a rather small affair. If it is extensive and well-financed, importing many products from all over the world and distributing them to many customers honestly, one should not criticize it severely. In fact, it even seems to deserve the highest respect if a merchant retires from the quayside to his farmhouse and estates. Of all pursuits by which men gain their livelihood, none is better than agriculture. And so you can hear Cicero there uh, praising, uh, uh, damning with faint praise here, um, uh, commerce, noting that if it's small, it's vulgar. If it's large, it may be a little better, should not be criticized severely, but really it's better if it's redeemed by being turned into land and agriculture. Um, and we can see an example of that from the satirical uh, story of Trimelchio, who was a slave who gained wealth through the, the wine trade and imagined that would make him a respectable member of society. And the parody is, uh, you can't put li lipstick on a pig and make them anything other than a pig, that he still remains a boorish member of the outsiders and the wealth has not bought him um, it might have bought him access, but it has not bought him respect. And so those are two, um, two responses to merchants from the perspective of the Romans. And the fact that merchants are at the center here really highlights that John is saying something that perhaps his audience might relate to, that a city or empire based on merchants is one that would not get much respect. And they're the focus here right at the center. So unlike the kings who weep and wail, they weep and mourn. Why? Because no one buys their cargo anymore. 
And the word for buy here, agarazo, we, is the final use here, but it connects us back to 1317 when we were told no one could buy or sell unless they had the mark of the beast and its name on their forehead. And so uh, they were selling to people who could do that, and now that's all gone. The word for cargo here, gamen, is only here in the next verse, uh, highlighting that this is about that international trade. And although it's easy to skip over the list of cargo, I want to read it and highlight it for a couple of important reasons. One is we can just say it was a lot of commerce, but one of the questions is where did it come from and what would that mean for John's audience? And what's the effect on readers of listing it all here? They could have just simply said no one buys their cargo anymore and skipped to verse 14. But in addition to echoing the cargo list from Ezekiel, there's an emotional effect. So as I read this, I invite you to pay attention to how it makes you feel to, to hear this list. No one buys their cargo anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, jewels and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk and scarlet, all kinds of scented wood, all articles of ivory, all articles of costly wood, bronze, iron and marble, cinnamon and spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, olive oil, choice flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, slaves and human lives. Wow. It's a long list. It's exhausting just to read it all out loud. But to envision all that stuff uh, is really uh, shows exactly what's at the center of the Roman economy and Babylon's uh, luxury with which the kings of the earth have committed fornication, as we've seen. When I would do this in churches, I'd often ask people to look at the list and what do you think holds them all in common? And because the list starts with gold and silver, people often say, well, luxury items. But when it ends, it ends with ordinary things, which would say olive oil, flour, and wheat are the sta- and wine are the staples of everyday life. But it ends with slaves and human lives, which is to highlight two things. Everything is for sale. And as we'll see in a moment looking at a map, these are all imports from the perspective of John's audience in the province of uh, Roman Asia and the current day Western Turkey. Um, In other words, it's a picture of the global economy. Uh, Let's look at that map in two different ways. Here I've taken a standard map and imposed on it just the items that are listed here in our passage. And they're not listed precisely. These are just from Spain. They're not from particular regions there. I was just putting them out there. And some are from other places, like from China, which is not even on the map. And these are jewels and spices from India, which is also not on the map. But highlighting the huge scope of the Roman global economy. Let's look at it from another perspective. This isn't linked to Revelation. This is a hundred years later, roughly, um, showing the Roman trade network, not just the items that are on our list, but all kinds of other things. And you can see how wide, ex- widely extensive it is. And immediately, our area here, there's not much from there. Um, pigs are listed here and some olives, but you see how almost all these things are from elsewhere. So for John's audience, these things are only available because the ship owners and the sailors and the merchants have brought them to them. And then we see the incredible description of uh, uh, that John uses for what these things represent. And I'll scroll down the screen just a little bit so we can hear see that whole description in one unit here. The fruit for which your soul longed has gone for, from you, and all your dainties and your splendor will be lost to you, never to be found again. Let's look up close at some of the words there because there's some translation issues that are important. The word for fruit here is literally ripe fruit. And uh, when I scroll down here further on, you can see that's an echo from Jeremiah here, translated as summer fruits, and your vintage the destroyer has fallen. Uh, soul is almost always wrong, is always wrong in the New Testament. Pesuke simply means lives, and we see how that matches human lives here as Pesuke. It's plainly not souls there. So the fruit for which your life longed, and the word for long here, epithumius, um, is a strong sense of desire, um, as Beale notes, evokes Rome's addiction to consumption. And epithumius is something that Roman writers, especially philosophers, who became the basis for what, when the gospel of Jesus in its Jewish context got morphed into the Greco-Roman context, a little later, I uh, hated the kind of desire that showed a, a gruff spirit, someone who was not a full human being, who had not let their logos, their mind, uh, and their reason control their desires. So the idea that people had these great desires that people went to international links to satisfy is already a moral fault um, for the for the you that's being addressed here, which is to say, of course, Babylon itself. And your dainties and your splendor. And the, the Greek is worth listening to because there's a sound play here. Lepra kai to lampra. And as various people, Beale suggests glitter and glory. Uh, Kester suggests glitter and glamour. And I suggest dainties and delights. To get that alliteration of not just your staples, but all your luxury items, all the goodies that privileged people around the 
world and the elite want that distinguishes them, you know, not just gold and silver, but the nice ornaments for your house and your fancy clothes, etc. It's all lost, never to be found again. And the phrase umi is the strong case for never will become a refrain in the chiastic closure of our section in 1821 to 23. And finally, we're going to close on the merchants here. Uh, there's no word for wares here, simply the merchants of these who gained wealth from her um, will stand far off, just like the king stood off, weeping and mourning aloud, repeating that phrase from uh, what we saw a few verses earlier, crying out, woe, woe to the great city, clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, which we've already seen, adorned with gold and jewels with pearls. And again, this is an element that I learned from uh, the work of Glancy and Moore, who highlighted this does not describe her as a courtesan, a, a high-class prostitute, but as a, the dress-up act of a brothel slave, as someone who dreams that they're a queen, as we saw in the last uh, section, uh, dressed in her finery, uh, the city wearing all these imports, and in one hour, all this has been made desolate. Uh, Aramatha, hence from Aramas, like a wilderness. So not just laid waste like destroyed, but desolated or deserted. It's all gone. And so with that, we will turn to the final uh, group, the sailors and ship owners, as John completes the revelation of the collapse of the Roman imperial economy or imperial economies throughout the ages. See you next time for that. Bye-bye.